Looking to be more productive and jump those hurdles of change and challenge easier? You've come to the right place. Welcome to Thrive in Life with your hosts, Zaheen Nanji. Hello and uh, welcome to the Thrive in Life show. I'm your host, Zaheen Nanji. In this show, we help you make resilience your first reflex. Today, we have Claire with us, and uh, she's going to talk about the resilient brain. So just uh, I just wanted to introduce her first before we dive into the juicy stuff. So she owns a company called Brain Smart Mind Power in Action. I love that, mind power. So she has a diploma in the neuroscience of leadership and has completed the foundations of psychology with the College of LPS at the Penn State University in USA. She's actually on the interview from UK though. <laughs> uh, she also specializes in a lot of stuff which she is going to tell us about, uh, but she has a book on storytelling for communicators and leaders called A Sprinkling of Magic. Claire, come on on and say hi to everyone. Hello, everybody. I'm so thrilled to, to be speaking with you, Zaheen, and to be speaking with your listeners today as well. Yes. Well, I'm thrilled because me and you are all about the same thing, resilience. <laughs> we are. We certainly are. And I just want to tell the audience how we met. Uh, so we met in a course that we both took with Hugh Culver, who is a mentor of ours when it comes to the speaking industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we met through there and uh, we became friends. And this is how you meet people, right? When Absolutely. you join courses or you join Facebook groups where you have the same interests. So Claire, let's start with what is your definition of resilience? Okay, well, if we use the metaphor of a roller coaster, that, that life, you know, life is a roller coaster. It has its ups and its downs, and we're not going to be able to flatten that out. So my definition of resilience is that we have two choices as to how we ride that roller coaster. Mm -hmm. One, we could get in there, we could hang on for grim death, eyes closed, and hope it'll all be over really, really soon. Or we can choose to get in the front carriage, eyes wide open, and hands in the air. And that for me is resilience, learning to ride the roller coaster of life with hands in the air in the front carriage. I love that metaphor. Uh, and I will tell you, I have been on one of those and it's scary. It <laughs> and certainly it's really is. Eyes closed because I feel sick to my stomach. <laughs> but it can also be exciting. It can. Um, and I envy my daughter who's 11 and I've gone with her. Um, and she can just look up and put her hands in the air and yeah. just yell. And I just look at her with envy and I go, okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to model her. <laughs> um, so tell me your story. What made you get into this area? Um, how, how did you use the skills to bounce back? Okay. Um, how I got into the area of resilience is probably more from a, a business perspective. I was, you know, I was seeing people really, really struggle through change. Mm. But if it's okay with you, Zahina, I'd like to share what is actually quite a, a personal story. Yes, please. Because, because I think it, um, it, it explains well where I'm come from and why I'm, I'm so passionate about this. So when I was 40, I met the man of my dreams. It, it mm. took me a little while. And the reason it took me a little while is, and I'm sure there are many of your listeners have been in this situation. I was in a relationship when I was younger that was quite destructive and, and quite violent. And actually, it was the emotional violence that hurt more than the physical violence. And what I did was I built up this huge defense wall. And I wasn't even conscious of it. It was more a subconscious defense wall where I just kept at arm's length from people. And, you know, eventually I learned to build my resilience skills. And that's how I was open to meet Jason. And Jason happened to be from Australia and I was in the UK. So we decided to make a go of it and we moved to Australia and we then decided we'd like to start a family and we tried. 
and nothing was happening happening naturally. We weren't having a lot of practice. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we decided to go down the IVF route. Mm -hmm. And after multiple attempts and very, very high credit card bills, um, I decided I, that was it. I, I just couldn't take it anymore. Mm. And, I, and I sat down with him and I said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that, um, you know, you can't be the amazing dad that I know you could and would be. But I just can't do this anymore. And his response floored me. And he said, hey, look, it was never, it was never about kids. Kids would have always been a bonus. This is about you and me. Mm. Always has been, is now, and always will be. Mm. And, and, you know, it took that experience for me to really see him and see who he is. And then that led on to a, another um, way of building my resilience, which is to see things from a different perspective. So when people ask me now if I have a family, I say, yeah, I've got three kids. I've got one in Ghana one in Kenya and one in Cambodia and I pay for their education and I don't get any of the hassles. So I still have a family. It's just a sponsored family. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you uh, spoke about your husband and how you sat with him and said, Hey, you know, um, that was so emotional. Um, for yeah, I can wipe my eye now. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, it almost like I was just feeling for you because I can completely understand that too. I mean, even though I've got kids, mm -hmm. uh, but it's nice to have the companion part of it where, um, and I always say this to my husband, when I was interviewed in another um, show, mm -hmm. he, the host asked me, so who's your coach? And I say, my husband. <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes, it's free of charge, is it? <laughs> that we, we, we end up with our greatest teachers. Yes, yes. And he is mine because every time I feel um, like, you know, grim and just holding my hands on the roller coaster, um, I bounce on him to yeah. get something that I feel good about myself that I can bounce back up again. Um, so I say, yeah, he's my coach. <laughs> Excellent. That, that is an amazing story, Claire. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for allowing me to. So can you give us some insight into what you mean by the resilient brain? Yes, this is, this is a fascinating area of study and it's so exciting. And actually, Zaheen, we are just at the very, very tip of the iceberg of understanding um, about the, the, the possibilities and the potential of our brain. So some of your, your listeners or viewers might or might not be familiar with this concept of neuroplasticity. So up until only about 10 years ago, we thought that once we reached about the age of 40 that our brain had matured and started to decline and that's absolutely not true so our brains are now capable of making new connections which means that we can learn new things so that concept of teaching old you know you can't teach an old dog new tricks we can mm. throw that out the window because we can and what this means for the potential of resilience is that we you know it may be that we had an upbringing where we didn't have an opportunity to practice resilience, you know, and resilience is built by experience. Yes. But the good news is, is that we can, it doesn't matter how old we are, we can learn to become resilient. And what I mean by the resilient brain, we, it, we almost have to go back to, you know, our earliest of human experiences. Mm -hmm. where if I, can, um, if I can build a brain with my hand, if that's, if that's okay, I can explain it that way. So this is, this is our brain stem, so the, the very bottom of the brain, and then this goes down to our spine. And this is the part of the brain basically that keeps us alive and does all of our automatic functions, breathing and blood flow, etc. Now, see my thumb here? Yeah. That is the emotional center of our brain. And it's tucked away right in the middle. And it's quite small. And then we have the executive, the 
cortex, the executive function of our brain that is different to all of the mammals. This is exclusively human in the sense that it can do all our rational thinking and, and visioning and decision making. Now, this little fella, though, rules the roost when it comes to stress. So again, this is what we call the limbic system. And within the limbic system is housed the amygdala. Mm -hmm. The amygdala is responsible for our fight or flight or freeze response. So when we lack resilience, we let this guy get in charge far too often. So just for the listeners who are listening yes. to the podcast... Claire is uh, saying that the thumb that is on the palm of her hand is the part of the limbic system. Yes. Okay. So continue. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. I'm, I'm highly visual at the moment. So that's the emotional center of our brain. Now, when we want to build resilience mm -hmm. from a brain perspective, what we're wanting to do is dampen down the activity of the limbic system and we want to get that transferred, the processing transferred to this executive function. We want to get away from the fight or flight and we want to get into the calm and rational. And all of the exercises that you and I share with people, that is their primary purpose. And, and this is what's so wonderful is we think, oh, my goodness, it's an evolutionary uh, response that we have. You know, no, we don't have woolly mammoths and enemy tribes running around anymore. But it could be as simple as hearing footsteps late at night. Yes. Or it could be from a work perspective. It could be your boss saying, oh, Zaheen, can I see you in my office when you get back from lunch? Yeah, yeah. That's the equivalent of a woolly mammoth today. And what happens? What, you know, your heart yeah. starts and your breathing increases. And so this is what we're doing to create the resilient brain. Everything starts with a thought. Oh, yes. Thank you for saying <laughs> that. Everything starts with a thought. <laughs> and so do you find that... Um, this is where I find, I think, a lot of the listeners and viewers, you know, watching this or listening are thinking, so is it the emotion that leads to the thought, like the anxious feeling, and then we have thoughts, or we have a thought that, that then that leads to an emotion? That's a, br that's a brilliant question. Okay. So if we think about um, an event mm -hmm. takes place. Now, the event in and of itself um, can be considered neutral because, for example, the roller coaster ride, your daughter sees that roller coaster ride as a fantastic thrill, and you think of it as, Whoa, I'm really getting out of my comfort zone here. So, we will have a thought about that event. Now, it depends, so it's, it's how we think about the event that produces the feeling or emotion. If we think that an event is going to be scary and horrible, we then have the emotion that follows very quickly is fear. If we think that an event is going to be thrilling and exciting, the emotion is excitement. Whatever the predominant emotion is, will then be observed in our behavior mm. and our language, how we speak about it, how we behave about it. And that, in turn, determines the results or the outcomes that we get. So it can either be a vicious circle or a virtuous circle. So it, everything starts with an awareness. How am I thinking about this situation? Yes, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Um, so to recap, it's, it's the event, right, which is the stimulus yes. that leads to the thought. Yes. And then the thought leads to the feeling. Yes. And then the feeling leads to the behavior. Absolutely. And uh, I think an important part uh, about this from the perspective of the brain, because we now know that the main job of the brain is to keep us safe. So... If we've had, if we've experienced an event in the past, 
and we had a negative reaction to it, the brain will, when the, a similar event comes up the next time, the brain will go, uh-oh, you be careful about that there. Mm-hmm. You know, do you remember what happened last time? Let's just keep you safe. Let's just make this a bit scary. And so the, by building our skills of resilience, we get back in the driving seat and we say, hang on a minute. Yes, I know. I know that that past experience was scary, but that past experience was different. It's not the same as this experience. So what is it that I can learn from the past that will help give me a different reaction or response this time? So what it's actually, what's happening in the brain is we're learning to uncouple those old set patterns and create new pathways of thinking. Yeah. Yes, that makes total sense. So the idea then is when you're thinking is to just become aware and stop for a moment instead of going into the flight or, you know, or like freeze, right? So absolutely. Okay. So just for the listeners and the, and the viewers to understand that this is where it comes in into building the first step when you yes. bounce back is, is to become aware of your thoughts. Awareness is everything. It, okay. it, it really is because even just, even just the process of stopping and saying, isn't this interesting? So getting a little bit curious, observing what's going on here. What am I thinking? Even just saying that to yourself, either out loud or silently, is already starting that process of dampening down the limbic reaction and heightening the calm, rational response. Yes, yes. You know, I I just want to share a story about about the way the brain works and the limbic system. And I can see all this in a story Uh, that happened to me last year. I had gone to a conference uh, and it was a conference about how, how to be speakers and authors and things like that. And I was sharing a room with a lady that I met on the Facebook group that was for this conference. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know her. I had never met her. (laughs) And we were sharing this room. And she's African American. And at that time, there was riots happening in one of the towns in the US. Now, I can't remember what that was. And it, it was about how this young African American boy had been shot or you know adult boy Mm -hmm. um had been shot and uh he was in the hospital and so on um and her eyes were glued to the news cnn news they were just glued and she kept on feeling worse and worse and worse um and on the second day i just had to ask her because it was starting she was starting to sound like she didn't want to be there. She said, I should have just been home. And and I just stopped and I said, hold on, what is going on? Why is this news making you so, like, you know, feel just so down, right? And that's when she told me that she lost two sons in one day. Oh, my goodness. Yes. So one was actually shot in the back uh, by a cop. Uh, and and one was um, in the hospital, and he was dying from a heart condition. Mm-hmm. And she said, I lost one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Now, I couldn't imagine being in her shoes. Um, and then she went on to share what happened. And mm-hmm. so watching the news yes. brought back memories, and she was – increasing the limbic system where she wasn't calming herself down or thinking yes. about, well, this is interesting. Why am I feeling this way when I watch mm. the news? But she was going into the flight or freeze mode. Right? Yes. 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 Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. And, and when we have those type of reactions and that, you know, that one is particularly strong. Yes. Um, the, the quicker we can, try and dissociate from the event that's happening, the negative event. Um, There may need to be some 
time lapse between being able to say that and really mean it to yourself and saying, you know, isn't this interesting? Where's this coming from? Um, and, and trying to find a new and positive meaning to it. Because, you know, as, as you know, as well, Zaheen, positive psychology is not about being happy all the time. This is, this is rational optimism. This is being able to give ourselves tools to be able to to come out of those dips a little quicker so that we can be resourceful again. It's not denying that the dips don't happen. And I think that's a, a perfect story to illustrate it. Yes. Mm. But she felt better afterwards because we talked and reframed the whole situation. And yeah, it was good. <laughs> can I quickly share something with you that I learned recently about yes. that? So yes. the, the brain is a social organ. And if you think about this, going back again to our earliest of, of caveman days, we're tribal in nature. So if we were cast out of the tribe, we'd be lucky to even last a day. So our, our brains connect with each other. And, and this is why connection and re-engaging with your support networks is the strongest um, pillar of resilience in a way. And we've been able to find out through brain imaging technology that just the act of sitting silently in community with someone or a group of people um, increases the safety factor in our brain. Hmm. So that it helps so interesting. just in connection. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I, I didn't know about, I mean, it was interesting how you went back with the way we were um, in the olden days. From an evolutionary perspective. With, with our, yeah. Uh, and I didn't realize, yeah, that, uh, you know, once you are cast out, that, that was it. Uh, so this, that, that is interesting how the brain works when you're just yep. working with people. Yes, that makes total sense. And I think one of the things that if, if we are really, really struggling to, to get back out of that dip, sometimes we feel that we're being a burden on other people. Mm -hmm. And, and that sometimes can be the slippery slope to depression because mm -hmm. we feel we don't want to be a burden. So we withdraw when actually the opposite is needed. We, we need to reconnect with people and our brains will, you know, will communicate even, even though we're not speaking. And we'll release those hormones that, that reduce the levels of stress hormones when, you know, when we're stressed and we're producing adrenaline and cortisol, being, being in community with people um, helps bring us back into equilibrium, back into balance. I'm glad you mentioned that about the burden because um, uh, just to, uh, we, you know about this, Claire, but just for the listeners and the viewers, um, you know, I found out that I had cancer in my breast in, in, in August. And, um, uh, oh, that's just my reminder. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, and I found, and so I had to go through surgery and things like that. But the amount of friends and family that came forward just to say, please, if you need anything, ask us, ask us. And there was a time that I felt, no, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be a burden. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, but you're right. I have found that now um, when they ask me, hey, do you need a ride? You know, don't, you know, ask us if you have to go somewhere and you can drive and things like yeah. that. And I go, sure, I will ask you. You are on my list now. <laughs> You know, this is great, Zaheen. Again, getting back to the brain, we now know that giving is neurologically twice as rewarding as receiving. So if we don't take up people's offer of help, we're denying them the opportunity to feel really good. Yeah. And that's another trait of resilience. You'll find that highly resilient people often do voluntary work. They have a, a perspective of a focus on others. They don't have that focus on self, that sense of ego. And we now know that when we, you know, there were experiments done with money where um, people could either be given the opportunity to give money or receive money. And when they gave money, their, their happy hormones were just going off the scale. So I think that's a really important point is, honor people's requests um to, to help. help yeah yes okay so um tell us 
what would be your tip for the listeners on how they can help to further build the resilient brain? Um, just one, two simple tips that they can start today to, to kind of take okay. away. Great. Well, I think the one of the main tips is actually a validation of an old wives tale of when something happens where you feel this instant reaction, say somebody cuts you up in traffic or somebody says something that pushes your button is about literally count to 10 and bring your breathing low in your diaphragm. That that aspect of breathing and counting is actually transferring the brain processing from the amygdala to the prefrontal cortex. And it's about in the, in the gap, in that 10 second gap, we then have the, we get the clarity of mind to be able to respond rather than react. And I'm not sure if I'm going to quote it correctly but the one of my mentors who's been dead for a long time is a guy called Viktor Frankl are you familiar with Viktor Frankl yes. who was an Austrian Jewish psychologist who survived three concentration camps and one of the most powerful quotes that that I learned from him he said between stimulus and response there is a space and in that space lies our power to choose our response mm. and in that response lies our growth and our freedom mm. so next time somebody cuts you up in traffic or what have you just what do you know what I do I thank myself I thank myself for being calm and not losing it <laughs> and then I think, we have no idea what's going on in that person's world and I'm not gonna let this ruin the rest of my day well done, Claire. <laughs> yes, yes. I actually bless them and I go bless you. That's a great strategy. <laughs> it really is. Because we don't know what's going on in their world. We can't mind read. That's right. Well, that's a great strategy. So take a deep breath, count to 10 and choose your response. Yes. Okay. Any other tip you have? Or that, that's a good one to start with. I just reinforce the connection. Let, let people help. Stay connected. Um, and see what good you can do for others. Yes. You know? awesome. when, because when we're focusing on helping other people, we, we can't focus on our own woes. Um, and if we're struggling with that, the best antidote to worry is purposeful action. Yes. Oh. Yeah. So do, oh, do you know that worry is an acronym? It stands for working on rubbish and ruining yourself. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so if we're worried about something, write it down. What's the worst that could happen? Could I live with this? Could I, if I can live with it, great. What's the first thing I'm going to do tomorrow to, to act on it? Yes. And with that note, uh, you know, Claire, I can believe we're almost to the end of our time here. Oh, uh, my goodness. That's gone so yeah. quickly. Yes. And that's what happens when you're having fun. Yes. Uh, so I would like to uh, tell the listeners and the viewers, uh, when we do these kinds of shows for you, it's, it's to help you move forward in life. It's to help you not stay stuck, but... Go through the obstacles and know that you'll come through with new learnings. So go thrive in life. Until next time, bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to Thrive in Life with your hosts, Zaheen Nanji. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit ZaheenNanji.com. That's Z-A-H-E-E-N-N-A-N-J-I.com. We'll catch you on the next episode of Thrive in Life.